I love this man. I've known him forever and a day. He was at my wedding, and uh, and he's the, the best at what he does. And it was great to hear his voice, Clemson Notre Dame, on Saturday night on NBC Sports. And then I watched him get us ready for that boat race. My gosh, in Tampa last night. He's Mike Tirico. How are you, Mike? Hey, buddy. How are you, Rich? I am fine. You all traveled out in a world where hardly anybody's traveling. <laughs> yeah, it was, it, was, it was quite a weekend. You, you couldn't ask for a for a better weekend in terms of uh, games and events and all that stuff. It was uh, it was quite a weekend. It well, really was. so I will give you the floor first on the scene uh, in Notre Dame. Uh, it just, you know, popped through the television set. Um, and then we saw all those kids running on the field. But the football yeah. first aspect of it, um, what, what did we learn from that game on Saturday night, Mike? Uh, so so let, let's go let's go big picture with Clemson first. Clemson's a really excellent team. I know we've known that, but you know sometimes you, you can say it's a team. A team is one year, and I should rephrase it as a, a, a elite program because they were without three of their better defensive players. They're, the quarterback of their defense, James Skalski, a linebacker inside, uh, an NFL caliber defensive lineman. And another linebacker, actually the son of Mike Jones, who made the tackle of Kevin Dyson in the Rams Titans Super Bowl in Atlanta. Uh, he's a very good linebacker for them. So they were without three significant parts of their team on defense. And then they're without as good a player as there's on the offensive side, Trevor Lawrence. And they still on the road against a really good team went to overtime. So I, I think it just tells us what a great program Dabo Sweeney's built there. Having said that, DJ Uyunglele, the quarterback, played really well. He's going to be a future star. They've got great things to build around after Lawrence. But on the Notre Dame side, it shows you that even though they're in a league for a year, they're still an independent. As an independent in this construct, Notre Dame can still be extremely relevant at the highest level of college football. And that's full credit to Brian Kelly, who after a 4-8 and eight season, hit the reset button. I won't go through all the things that they did internally. But they have a product that's turning out NFL caliber players and can beat a great program like Clemson. So full credit to where Notre Dame is now and certainly as it has been for a lot of our lives in the conversation for best teams in the country. Well, I mean, they all, all they got to do, I guess, is win out um, and yeah. and maybe see a rematch here. And I, I, I would sign up for a rematch of this in, in a semifinal game if that's the way the, the committee can – can line it up and I, I would take Clemson, Notre Dame, Alabama, the Ohio State if that's the way it all works out uh, at the end of the day. Yeah. Right now, Mike? Uh, ex ex except for the folks who are listening and watching in you know, Cincinnati and out in Provo, sure. I, I think at most would be in agreement on that. You know, the Bearcats, the Cougars have had very good seasons and you know, do they deserve to be a part of the conversation? Here, here's the curious thing, and this is why. I really get frustrated with a sport I love. I know, you know, our, the friends at our old employer, ESPN, they make such hay in the conversation of sports and the the chaos that comes with college football really gives you a lot of juice for all the shows between games week to week, right? But but it's just so stupid that what happens on the field is still then has to be sifted through yeah. um, a selection committee and all this other stuff. The playoffs should be eight teams. There are five leagues that play in this level. Those five leagues, the Power Five, their champions, however they choose to crown them, should be in the playoff. One team from the group of six should be in the playoff, and then the other two best teams. And let's play it on the field this year and every year. It's really pretty simple to figure out and a way to do things. And, Rich, with the finances at colleges and universities and athletic departments losing eight figures in their athletic budgets these, this year, I think it might hasten the conversation for expanding a playoff to eight teams and get more playoff-generated money as a part of this, especially with uh, the other sports that people are trying to hang on to. Clemson just cut its track and field program. Mm. No program is making more money over this stretch than Clemson is, right? And they just had to cut a program uh, that, that's turned out some good athletes. So it's a, it's a time I think that college football should really look at it. Because let me just give you this point. If Notre Dame plays Clemson in an ACC championship game, Trevor Lawrence plays, everybody else plays, it's in Charlotte, Clemson wins, there might be a good argument to keep Notre Dame out of a playoff yeah. if Cincinnati or BYU is unbeaten. And that would that would be part part of the mix. Even though they've split, it would just be the timing of it. It's, just, it's kind of odd to watch the system work that way. But it's a 
big possibility. Well, and, and plus, you know, what if Notre Dame would do that and win again? Does that mean Clemson, you know, then get uh, right. look? I, we could go back and forth yeah. on this, but uh, but I, yeah, exactly. I, I I'm 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 totally in lockstep with you. I've I've been pounding this table that I'm sitting behind right now for, for years about an 18 playoff, and I think now's the time to do it. We just saw. Like literally this year, and I know that 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 this is already that horse is back in the barn right now. But uh, I'll still say it here anyway, since we're we're opining um, that that this is the year. You saw Major League Baseball expanded their playoffs because of mm. what happened with with a an obviously different season due to COVID. Uh, the NFL right now has already got a plan in the in the front right drawer uh, desk drawer of uh, probably the commissioner and everyone else's. Uh, in case that they have to just have an expanded season because the re- postseason, because the regular season is changed by this virus, why, why not right now? I mean, right. like this would be it right now for everybody to enjoy. Rich, every you're, you're right, buddy. Every sport has the balls up in the air because of the complete tumult that there has been with the regularity of the sports calendar. So it's a great opportunity to step back, reassess, come back in a different way. Uh, Randy Moss, or not Randy Moss of the Vikings fame and uh, future uh, Hall of Famer, I should say, but Randy Moss, who works on our horse racing coverage and works on NFL Network at times as well. Yes. He has said for years about horse racing, the Triple Crown should space itself out so the Derby goes in May and then the Preakness around Memorial Day and the Belmont around Fourth of July weekend. It would make more sense. Well, it's a time to do that because all the balls are up in the air. Do what's best for the long-term interest from 2020 to 2040 in your sports. If the NBA goes to 72 regular season games, however, folks have to redivvy this up. What an opportunity to do it. Maybe hockey saw something that we can take the you know, seeds 5 through 12 in each conference and play these mini best-of-five playoff series to get the final 16 teams, eight per conference, like they did in the restart in the bubbles. Maybe, maybe there was something out of this year that will create new, different, and higher-valued inventory because there's a ton of sports inventory out there. So if yours isn't high quality and of interest, it's time to move on or you'll get passed. And I think that given all the tumult, it'll be a great time to do it, and college football needs to be at the front of that train. Decide it on the field. Make each conference matter. Don't give me a debate about the Pac-12's relevance to – the SEC, play in your league, win your conference, play in the postseason, then you crown a true national champ. Mike Tirico here on the Rich Eisen Show. I was going to bring this up last, but I'll bring it up now since we're talking about reconfigured sports schedules due to the virus. It's Masters Week. Here we are in November, and I'm seeing the photographs that uh, that the Masters is is posting on on social media of the leaves changing at Augusta National, yeah. like it's something we've never seen before what do you think we're going to see this week mike what do you think yeah well i'm, gonna look I'm, like? I'm bummed because i'm not going to personally be there for right. the first time in, in quite some time uh for the coverage but i was down there a couple of weeks ago and i can tell you that it, it's not full fall foliage but it's just beautiful in its own way you're going to miss the the hues of the azaleas and everything else but it's just not it, it's not the same in that way but the place still looks spectacular it will play slightly differently because of the type of grass and the time of season, but it will still play fast. It's still perfect. The green speeds are going to be there like they are in April. And I, I'm just going to put this on your radar on Monday. This week, you will be talking about Bryson DeChambeau yep. at Augusta all across sports. He's going to hit the ball to places that we've never seen anybody hit it off the tee at Augusta tee. National. Right. He's going to have a myriad of shots in for second shots at this golf course that will be different than almost anyone we've seen, even when they had to quote tiger proof Augusta national uh, DeChambeau is going to have, you know, nothing. He's not going to hit any four or five irons into greens. Uh, he in all likelihood is going to be kind of seven, eight iron in. And I'm talking about par fives, not just the par fours. Uh, I, I hope he drives it well because it will be one of those things where you can't wait to see where he's going to hit it next. And it could be, very fascinating. Doesn't mean he's going to win. He's still got a putt, and I know he did in the last major, and he's confident about his putting there, I'm sure. But I'm just telling you, Rich, it is going to be the talk of golf, and thus because it's the Masters, the talk of the sports world this week, where DeChambeau hits it and what he's going to be able to do from those spots. So then let's come up with the phrase right now. Let's front load it because you can't say Bryson proof it. Well, like Brysonize it? Are they going to Brysonize? Right, right. Are they going to Brysonize oh, Augusta? Something like that. I mean, Shambies? 
the Shambies? <laughs> Do you, like, do, you like, do you like that? I do. I kind I, I, I don't know. The sham buys it because you know, they, they, they have run out of real estate, right? Have they run out of real estate oh, there they, to move things there, back? There are, places, there are places that they can extend some holes. 13 comes to mind. It's been a conversation for the last couple of years. But, Rich, it's less uh, Bryson doing it, or Augusta National, I should say. This is a case for all golf courses as we go forward. Bryson is hitting it farther than we've ever seen anybody hit it but he's also hitting it straight and that's the remarkable thing when you go back to Wingfoot. yes he did hit it deep but he also hit it in play so you know you can say grow rough which at augusta national there's a second cup but it's not the same effect as the rough at u.s opens or other tree line courses and yet he still has the opportunity because he's way down there to get it on the green here with a lack of high rough you're going to have even more opportunities. So there's not much you can do. It's just going to be interesting to watch. Do other players try to catch up to the speed, mm. carrying the ball 360 in the air that he has? The the speed, the power, all that stuff. He, he's, I think, Rich, he is as fascinating an athlete as we have in professional sports right now. And when you look at the physics background, how he's approached this, the protein, the all, all the things he's doing, it's really intriguing. I just think that if he has another big week after winning the U.S. Open, even though they're not on the same time in the calendar, it's really going to send that sport in, into a very interesting stretch of people trying to catch his distance. So then, uh, last one for you on this, is there a par four that you think he could table from the tee? Do you think, is is there mm, one? No. Based, no. Well, yeah, yeah, three. Three. The, the, the third hole after the par five second, you, you come back parallel to that, and the third plays under 400 yards. He could could get it there um it's a narrow it's a narrow green it's a difficult miss if you miss to the right uh if you're to the left you might have an angle the other thing is there are no patrons no fans there, right. so some of those areas are a little more accessible than they might have been otherwise when patrons are lining those spots that we've always seen them uh, that's why i'm really intrigued to watch hear the reports back from the practice rounds and then watch him uh, this week, it's going to be. I think it's going to be really cool to see, and I think it's going to be the the chit chat of the sports world after he plays on Thursday and Friday. A few more minutes left with Mike Tarico uh, again, fresh back from uh, South Bend, calling the Notre Dame overtime win over Clemson on NBC, and then uh, hosting uh, Football Night in America uh, as always uh, on Sunday nights on NBC. What do you take out of last night, Mike? What do you take from that? Well. I, I was heartened that uh, all the gang on Sam Ponder's show on Sunday NFL Countdown, and then you and and my man Kurt yes. and Mooch and Michael, you, you all you all picked there was Tampa too. Not a floor so, delay in sight, uh, Mike. Not a floor delay no. in the house. That's correct. So so we 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 had we had good we had good lead blockers. <laughs> and then on Football Night in America, when all of us picked uh, the Buccaneers as yes. well, uh, it just allowed for the triple troll to take place for Saints fans. <laughs> yes. Uh, so good, good yes. on you, New Orleans. Uh, should have known at that point that I should have gone the other way when everybody else mm-hmm. was going. I, I, I was stunned, not stunned that New Orleans won, but stunned with seeing that Tampa team that we thought, okay, here they go now. I mean, you know, they've got like this little fantasy football team of guys here with Edwins and God and uh, Evans and Godwin and obviously AB's at it and Gronk and Fournette and they, they, they got one of a kind. They, they got everything here. And the defense just was completely out of place and off pace. What a brilliant game plan by Sean Payton. And, and let's credit Drew Brees because, yeah, Drew Brees doesn't throw 40 yards, 45 yards in the air much, if at all, this year. But, man, the timing, the accuracy, it really is like um, watching a, a beautiful Broadway play, mm. uh, a musical, too, with the rhythm, the timing, the pace, the lines the spots they hit, and we should have thought about what they did against a good Chicago team in the last two weeks without their top two receivers. And now you get a 149 catch guy and a Super Bowl caliber receiver in Emmanuel Sanders uh, on the other side of Michael Thomas, throw them back in, and everybody else hit a good rhythm, and they look fabulous. Full credit to them, good for them, and, you know, it's nice. That NFC race is now wide open, and they've got a huge advantage with a game with really two game lead because of the head to head sweep in the NFC South. And that's the difference between a one seed and a five seed. And that's a lot, as we saw last year, 
with Seattle and San Francisco. All right, let's go sports talk format and ask the poll question of uh, yeah. Mike Tirico, fellow Syracuse Orange. Chris Brockman, ask it of uh, Mike Tirico, please. All right, Mike, who's the best team in the NFL, Steelers, Chiefs, Bills, or Saints? Those are the top four rec- by record. That's why we went yeah, down. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I would, I would take. Uh, I'd bet a slice at the varsity, which is our pizza joint at Q's. As well done, Chris. Well, no, well, <laughs> well knows. Uh, I would take a, a varsity slice on the Chiefs at this point. Um, you know, Pittsburgh, I think, is is very, very good. I just have a lot of belief in that Kansas City offense. No matter what your answer is defensively, I feel like they've got one last move. On offense, it feels like the Chiefs are always batting in the bottom of the inning. That no matter what you do in the top of the inning, they've got like one more to play, and they can get you last. Great and I think on the offensive side, they did that. And defensively, I, I get the feeling McDermott's crew is going to start coming together. I know they gave up thirty plus last week, but I, I trust them when they get in the playoff spot. So I, I think just because the offense is a touch more explosive than Pittsburgh, uh, I'll go there right now. Well, and I, I was talking to uh, our. Our uh, colleague Peter King in the first hour, Mike, about the me- the the one aspect or metric that is the perfect uh, that perfectly encapsulates just how Mahomes is looked at at such a ripe age of twenty five. It, it it's not, you know, although you can talk about the half billion dollar contract or the MVP in the Super Bowl or anything else. It is that we are already in the media treating him like Belichick for coach of the year or Phil Jackson for coach of the year. Like, <laughs> why well, give it to him? You know, he's already got everything. Uh, let's spread it around. Let's spread it around. Like, we're not looking <laughs> at him as the clear MVP that he is playing as. And he's 25. That's right. Mike. Right. At, at, at what, what year was Michael Jordan not the most valuable player in the NBA? I know. LeBron right now, right? That, Great. That kind of conversation. Exactly. Yes. Yeah. Rich, I, I, I kind of I, I was when when the conversation of the moment was and four weeks ago. Hey, Russell Wilson never got an MVP vote. He's having an MVP season. I'm like, it's it's September. Can we wait? And so I'm trying not to inject myself in MVP conversation until we get to right around Thanksgiving time because you know a guy can play ten games, eleven games. He gets hurt. It changes the calculus. Trevor Lawrence misses two games. It's going to change the conversation about the Heisman race a little. As long as he comes back and plays well, it's still going to be there, but it does impact it. So you can't get too far ahead on these things. But last night when we stopped and said 25 touchdowns, one interception, think about that for a minute. 25 yes. and one. That's, crazy. That's extraordinary stuff. Yes. He always gets it to the end zone and he never gives it to you. That's as valuable at the most important position in all sports. For an eight and one team, too. Uh, un- unbelievable. Oh. oh, my gosh. Mike, great weekend. Loved hearing you, watching you, seeing you. Um, you know, as always, thanks for the call. You take care. You be well. Any Anytime, pal. Best to Susan the kids. You bet. Same to you. That's uh, Mike Tarico here on the Rich Eisen Show. Hey, you watched all the way to the end. Thanks for that. Watch more right here.